just sort of jumped on, but if you yeah, want to explain. Whatever you want. Um, you know how it goes. It's just like yeah. Um, on the last one. What can I give? What can I bring to so faithful a friend, to so loving a king? Savior, what can be said? What can be sung as a praise of your name for the things you have done? Oh, my words could not tell. What can I give? What can I bring to so faithful a friend, to so loving a king? Savior, what can be said? What can be sung as a praise of your name for the things you have done? Jesus, what can
Show me the way of the cross once again. Denying myself for a love that I've gained. Everything's you now. Everything's changed. It's time you had my whole life. Show me the way of the cross once again. Deny myself for a love that I've gained. Everything's you now. Everything's changed. It's time you had my whole life. Some things must live. It's not what can I gain, but what can I give? If much is required and much is received, then you can have my whole life. Jesus has. Give them like a beggar, but live like the rich. And crafted myself a more comfortable cross. Yet what I am called to is deeper than this. It's time you had my whole life. You can have. Yes, I resolve to give it all. Some things must die, some things must live. Not what can I gain, but what can I give? If much is required and much is received, then you can have my whole. My whole life, mm. Jesus had it all. Have it all of me. You can have it all. Rising up from coast to coast, from north to south and east to west, the cry of hearts that love your name, which with one voice we will proclaim.
It's rising up from coast to coast, from north to south and east to west. The cry of hearts that love your name, which with one voice we will proclaim. So let that cry to nations ring. Knox Presbyterian Church, good morning. good morning. It's good to be together. I'm expecting we've got a couple of the people who are just rolling in. We're very prompt at Knox Presbyterian about the time that we start worship. So prompt that you can't even go to the bathroom if you have to right before. Sorry for some of us. Uh, it's good to be together today. I'm glad to see faces this morning. I was just helping lead worship for Bethany Presbyterian. We worship at 9.30 before Knox's worship service. I was preaching for them today because they're... Uh, temporary pastor Amy is out of town with her family uh, and I was struck um, by how good it feels uh, to have people in this space worshiping in similar and dissimilar ways one of the things about Bethany that I appreciate the most in uh, this might be because they are just so new here they've only been worshiping here since October but they've already formed a culture where every single person uh, sits at the front of the sanctuary. Uh, they're all just kind of around here and leave the back rows open, which is not part of all our culture and no judgment for us, um, but I was just was struck by that. Uh, and I was also reminded of what it was like, what feels like a very long time ago, where I was preaching twice uh, every morning, doing two different worship services every morning for a year. And uh, while I love being with Bethany, and I said yes to their invitation, I was happy to be there, uh, it was a helpful reminder that that's not my favorite. <laughs> not my favorite way to, uh, to worship. Uh, I'm glad that, um, well, I'm glad that we're together. We've got Christmas Eve approaching. Today's our fourth and final Sunday of Advent. Christmas Eve is going to be at 6.30 here and Bethany, the church I just mentioned, are going to be kind of our hosts for that worship service. Um, but I'll be uh, in it, as will Taylor and a handful of others. Uh, if you're around, love to have you. And then Christmas Day, we're going to sing some carols. You're going to hear a story. That's at 10 a.m. on Christmas Day. How long do you think that service is going to be? 45, 45 minutes. minutes. Not long. Yeah, if that feels like a meaningful way for you to spend uh, time on your Christmas Day. You'd be very welcome to be here. Um, we're going to get going with worship. Uh, and as a way of being able to help us center ourselves, I'm going to draw our orientation back to what we were talking a bit about last week, which is that as people of faith, we are oftentimes required to make sacrifices. We sacrifice things all the time. We sacrifice our time. We sacrifice money. We sacrifice our expectations. We sacrifice our energy. What you are doing this morning, therefore, is an expression of faithfulness and a practice by choosing to sacrifice your time right now, a time that you could spend doing anything else. Sacrificing this time for the next hour, you are practicing what it's like to be a person of faith. You are practicing what it's like to be someone who is going to sacrifice something that could otherwise maybe be beneficial for you or to do something that's going to satisfy your self-interest and choosing to bring yourself here before God. I'm glad that we're here together to be able to do that. That's the orientation that I'd like for us to be able to have as we begin our time in worship this morning and to help us begin to prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. We're going to listen to Carol, 
who's going to be playing some bells for us this morning. Your bulletin says that it's Carol and Lois, but at the last minute, Carol just said, you know what, Lois, I got this. I'm going to do it by myself. <laughs> Let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
This is the fourth Sunday of Advent, and the theme is peace. And I will be reading from the prophet Isaiah, from chapter 10, 33, and we'll move through into uh, chapter 11, 10. See, the Lord, the Almighty, will lop off the boughs with great power. The lofty trees will be felled. The tall ones will be brought low. He will cut down the forest thick thickets with an axe. Lebanon will fall before the mighty one. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and the spirit of might. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together. And the little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together. And the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den. And the young child will put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord. As the water, waters cover the sea, in that day the root of Jesse will stand as a banner, for the peoples, the nations will rally to him, and his resting place will be glorious. So what is peace? And what does it look like? God's peace is more than just anti-war, more than just a lack of suffering, but completeness and fullness. The world is satisfied. Isaiah shows us a vision of a world unfamiliar to us, one where natural enemies lie down together, where one or where a child leads all others. God's terrifying power ushers in a new age where righteousness takes center stage. There is destruction, Isaiah tells us, but that is not the whole picture. With short-sightedness, we may not see beyond our present suffering, but God sees growth from what is previously cut down. This shoot is the promise of new flourishing. This is the new creation that God is bringing us. In this familiar prophecy of Christ, we see a vision of Jesus' power, wisdom, and righteousness. His life will usher in something new to the world, undoing the previous problems we have faced. The knowledge of the Lord will cover the world as the waters cover the sea. That vision of fullness, that is a vision of peace.
Frederick Buechner wrote that peace is not the absence of struggle, but the presence of love. And if God is with us, then love is with us. And I was thinking about that um, this morning as I was trying to think of a prayer. And I was reminded um, of a poem that Frederick Buechner wrote when he was imprisoned by the Nazis. And this is um, a poem he wrote at his last advent, advent before his execution. So uh, I'll read these words as the prayer for us today. By kindly powers surrounded, peaceful and true, wonderfully protected with consolation dear, Safely I dwell with you this whole day through and surely into another year. Though from the old hearts, or though from the old our hearts are still in pain, while evil days oppress with burden still, Lord, give to our frightened souls again salvation and thy promises fulfill. And shouldst thou offer us the bitter cup resembling sorrow, filled to the brim and overflowing, we will receive it thankfully without trembling from thy hand so good and ever loving. But if thy will be again to give joy of this world and bright sunshine, then in our minds we will pass times we live and all our days will be wholly thine. Let candles burn both warm and bright, which to our darkness thou hast brought. And if that can be, bring us together in the light, thy light shines in the night unsought. When we are wrapped in silence most profound, may we hear that song most fully raised from all the unseen world that lies around, and thou art by all thy children praised. Come now, highest feast, on the way to everlasting freedom. Lay waste the burdens of chains and walls which confine our earthly bodies and blinded souls, that we see at last what here we could not see, Freedom, we sought you long in discipline, action, and suffering. 
In life and death, we recognize now the face of God. By kindly powers protected wonderfully, confident we wait for what come, or for come what may. Night and morning, God is by us faithfully and surely at each new born day. Lord, we trust that you are with us and that your love is with us. May we see that love and give that love fully. We pray these things in the name of your Son. Amen. In a moment, we'll invite you to come forward uh, with your offerings, be that um, your presence to light a candle to demonstrate what you are giving to God um, or any gifts that you bring forth as well. Um, but first, we will uh, join together in singing the doxology.
first scripture reading comes from the prophet Isaiah, and it's um, a confusing one. Drew, are you going to contextualize this at all, or should I do a 10,000-foot version? Go for it. Okay. So, um, 10,000-foot version. Something's rotten in the house of David. Um, there's two kingdoms, Judah and Israel, Israel to the north and Judah to the south. And they don't like each other. They're in strife. Um, there's an even bigger existential threat of Assyria that is um, threatening the destruction of God's people and these nations. And Ahaz, who um, in the Gospel of Matthew is listed as a, um, an ancestor of Jesus, is not portrayed as a very good king and is contemplating what to do. Do I um, get into this alliance with kings I distrust? Uh, do I basically sell my identity to try to defeat people I'm at war with, even if that means um, align with this existential threat? Um, and so the prophet Isaiah comes to Ahaz to try to give him some direction. And this is um, where our scripture reading comes in. This is Isaiah 7, 10 through 16. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol, or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary mortals that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. This is the word of the Lord. Okay, everybody, I'm going to make you move. I like Sundays like this when we're small because it can feel a little bit more intimate and to help us feel that way. I'm going to invite you to find a new seat that's within these first couple rows, and I'm just going to come down here and join you all. So go ahead and stand up, grab your stuff, grab your coats. There's lots of room down here. That was a really helpful 10,000-foot uh, view that Nick just gave because uh, at the top, really all you can see is uh, there's conflict here. There's tension here. Uh, that's oftentimes where we find God showing up. There's some unrest, there's something that needs to be mended, and uh, that's a good theological definition for peace, as both Sam and Nick today have stated, peace is not the absence of something, but the presence of something. So in conflict, God is present. And in the world that is rife with conflict, we, the instruments of God's peace, are called to be present in it. The story that I'm going to read for us right now is about this kind of conflict, tension and the ways that God calls us to be open and obedient to being instruments of peace, even when it requires sacrifice. This is Matthew chapter 1. I'm going to read starting at verse 18. I think this version is uh, very, very, very similar to the one that you have printed in your bulletin, but it might be just slightly different. 
goes like this. Now the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place in this way. When his mother, Mary, had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband, Joseph, who didn't know that she was with child from the Holy Spirit, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet Isaiah. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had born a son, and he named him Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Would you pray with me? Now, O Lord, prepare our hearts to accept your word. Silence within us any voice but your own, that in hearing we may obey your will. We acknowledge, Lord, that this is but one lens through which your holy word is proclaimed, and in that acknowledgement we ask for your grace to help us be understanding and patient with people who see things differently from us. Amen. Uh, there's a lot in this story that I wanted to talk about that we won't have time for. And I was, uh, there are lots of stories like this in the Bible where it's like, oh my gosh, there's so much here. I want to talk about this and this and this and this. And I realized that a, uh, a reason why it feels that way for me with this particular story is because we don't have a whole lot of stories about Joseph. So there's a lot that we could talk about because he's kind of a mysterious person in the Bible. Do you notice that in this story that we just read, uh, he doesn't say anything. Like, there's no quoted text for Joseph. That's the truth, not just for this gospel account, but for all four. The dude doesn't talk in the Bible. Uh, I just think that that's sort of remarkable and might give us some insights into uh, what our then gleaned uh, insights are in terms of how we can perhaps live the way Joseph lives. So we're going to talk a little bit about Joseph today. Joseph, much like the people of Israel, uh, has some tension going on in his life. There's some conflict here. Any guesses as to what that is? What's going on? What's the tension in his life? How does this, who knocked up my wife? Gosh dang it. Now that's, that's taboo in Christian culture and in other religious cultures today, getting pregnant before you get married. Uh, it was a little bit more than taboo in ancient Jewish culture. This was something that brought dishonor to your family. This is deeply problematic. Whenever there's a lack of honor, and someone's the clear perpetrator for it, there are consequences. And until those consequences happen, then that changes the dynamic 
people who are bringing dishonor are not going to be able to be in the same kind of relationship with the other people in their community, other people in their family, even perhaps even in relationship with God. So there's this tension. We're talking about Joseph's perspective in particular. There's this deep conflict for him. What do I do? What's to, what's to happen? That then leads him into a discernment process. Now, the text says that Joseph is a righteous man, and we can take that to mean that he's someone who tries to do the right thing. That means that he follows Torah. He's trying to live by the law of God, a law that was given in order for people to be uh, in good relationship, not just with God and themselves, but with themselves and everybody else. He's trying to live this way. He's trying to be obedient to God. And so he uses the tools given to him, Scripture, through his culture, through his religion, to try to work this out. You can presume that he's reading more of his Bible, trying to figure out what to do. It's not probably a stretch to suggest that he's probably praying about this. Maybe he's fasting. Maybe he's talking to other people, trying to get wise counsel. What do I do? I wonder how he felt. How would you feel? Betrayed? betrayed? Why would you feel betrayed? This is my this is my betrothed. Our families we went through all the process of, of arranging this marriage, and you're blowing all that up. You're betraying me, you're betraying this marriage, you're betraying our families. How else might you feel if you were in Joseph's position? Embarrassed? What are people going to think? What are, what's my family going to say? Angry? Why would you feel angry, Mike? Right. Why is this happening to me? You did something that doesn't just affect you, it affects me. Why are you doing this? I'm angry because it's a, why are you doing this to me? You're ruining my life. In many ways, this is what's going on. The implications for Mary, this person who has brought deep dishonor to their family, the implications for him to now continue on with his marriage are significant, not just for the immediacy of the moment, not just for the marriage and for that particular point in time, but this has implications for the rest of Joseph's life. It's going to have implications for whether or not he's able to get the kind of job that he might want to get, whether or not he's going to be able to be in relationship with his friends, with his family, not to mention the fact that for the rest of his life he's going to have to explain how all this stuff works. That's certainly an issue in contemporary culture. Why do you have, why do you have different last names? Why, is this person your biological child? How does this work? That's exhausting for people who just don't like living outside of the status quo. There's all this going on. I, I would think it would be reasonable to think that he might also be afraid. What'd you think? What's my mom gonna say? Oh my gosh, I'd be terrified. I actually have a very specific memory of being in high school. And I was in like the first serious relationship of my life. I was like 18. And my mom looked at me and she said, Drew, if you get her pregnant, everyone is going to look at you and blame you. This would have been something that you did that was bad. Uh, I thankfully didn't. <laughs> uh, but she put the fear of God in me when she said that. Yeah, I think, I think fear would be easy to assume for Joseph in this. So all of those things are impacting his discernment process. 
there's a tension, there's some conflict going on, what do we do about it? Uh, and there's, go ahead, Mike. Yeah. 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 Uh, Mike, Mike's uh, bringing up the concept of honor killings. Um, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a Semitic expert, uh, but we've, Taylor and I talked about this with some other colleagues on Tuesday this last week, and it sure seems like people were killed for less offenses than this. Yeah, this certainly would be something that puts her very, very, very far uh, on the margins, even more so than she already was as a, as a young woman. Yeah, fear for her. It says that he's an, a righteous man, so maybe it's his concern and fear for her that might be impacting his desire to want to do this quietly, not want to make this a big deal, because there could be implications for her. He's trying to do the right thing. Trying to figure out, God, what do you want me to do? This isn't good. There's dishonor here based on your law, based on what relationship has looked like with you and with the other people of faith that I know. I think that this is what I have to do now. So he, he spent some time, and it, the text says that uh, he had made up his mind. Other translations say that while he was still making up his mind, the, the, uh, the tense here is a little bit hard to interpret, but either way, whether he had made up his mind or whether he was still figuring it out, he goes to sleep one night. Sorry, let me back up. Before that, let's just say he gets to a point of resolve, saying, if I'm going to solve this tension, there's a conflict in my life, I'm going to solve this, then I'm realizing I need to make a sacrifice. And this is the case, sacrifice, that is, is the case. Uh, most of the time, we need to make some kind of change. Most of the time, there's some tension there needs to be resolution here. We can't have both of these going on at the same time. That usually requires us to give something up or make some kind of sacrifice. In this case, for Joseph, he can't have the life that he was expecting to have. He's not going to have the future that he thought God had laid out for him if he's married to a woman who's always going to be bringing that kind of dishonor or if his child is always going to be regarded as a bastard. So the way that he solves this tension is to choose sacrifice. And the object of his sacrifice is his marriage. He goes to sleep, feeling this resolve. Uh, and then he has a dream. <laughs> has anyone ever had a dream where uh, you wake up after it and you're like, boy, I have no idea where that came from. That felt really weird. Uh, I don't really know what to make of that. Anyone ever had one of those? Yeah. Uh, Joseph, I think, has one of these dreams. And because you've had one before, you know that it is not a given that Joseph is then able to say yes to what God is calling him to do. He still has a choice here. The angel says, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. He could wake up from that and say, no, I, don't, I don't think that that was real, which would have been because he doesn't want that to be real. I don't want that to be my reality. I don't want to have to choose this life that blows everything up that shifts my expectations from what I thought I was going to be able to have. Hi, Olivia. Hi. Good morning or good afternoon. He could have said no, or he could have said, you know, that just, I, it was a dream. Like, I made that up. That wasn't God. That wasn't an angel, a messenger of God. He could have pulled an Ebenezer Scrooge. My favorite version of uh, Dickens' The Christmas Carol is the Muppet version. And uh, in that, Michael Caine, uh, when he first sees his, uh, the ghost of his partner, Jacob Marley, uh, Jacob is telling Scrooge, like, you've got to change. You've got to do something. Like, this is not going well. It's time to make some sacrifices. It's time to make some changes. 
And Scrooge, not wanting that to be his reality, is like, I don't believe that you're real. You could be a bit of undigested cheese that's tricking my brain. There's more of gravy than a grave about you, is what he says. Joseph chooses in his discernment process, and this is what I think keeps him about as righteous as you can get. He chooses, even though he's gotten to this point of resolve, to stay open and to receive what God has to tell him. He's open to hearing the word of God, the actual voice of a messenger of God. That voice challenges him. It challenges him to make a different kind of sacrifice. The object of Joseph's sacrifice, in order to resolve this tension, sacrificing his marriage, that's the sort of object that many men before Joseph had made. And thousands and thousands of men since then have made. The choice to sacrifice relationship for the sake of being able to have the life that I want to have. I think it's really important to be able to name a core motivator whenever these kinds of decisions have been made. And it's fear. What are they going to say? What's my life now going to look like? What kind of opportunities are even going to be available to me? This is not the plan. even though it's the harder sacrifice to make, I think, in being open to hearing what God wants from Joseph, he is actually willing to shift the object of his sacrifice. Rather than trying to preserve his status quo expectations for his life, and in so doing, sacrificing his marriage, he flips these in order to be able to save his marriage, preserve relationship with Mary, and in so doing, support the call that God has placed upon her life. He chooses to sacrifice his self-preservation. He sacrifices the expectations that he has for his life. He sacrifices, in many ways, what he thought his whole future was going to be. A life of faith, trying to live like Joseph, where we're trying to do the right thing, is one that for us who are trying to follow Jesus is always going to demand sacrifice. And more often than not, what I see and hear is that those kinds of sacrifices are usually of our expectations and almost never at the expense of relationship. I don't have to tell you how agonizingly similar this story is, at least Joseph's first decision that he makes. I'm going to sacrifice this for the sake of preserving expectations, how similar that is to so many queer people in their Christian families. People who are blowing up their family's expectations of what their family's going to look like. Those families are then saying, what, what's the rest of the family going to say? What are they going to think? This is changing everything. Whenever there's tension, sacrifices must be made. But through hearing the voice of God, Joseph chooses to make a different one. He sacrifices what he thinks he was going to have in his life. He sacrifices the very things that are making him angry, that are making him feel betrayed, making him feel confused. He sacrifices all of that in order to be able to support Mary's call. She is called to do something amazing, something beautiful. I love uh, what the angel invokes here, by the way. This unnamed angel says, Joseph, son of David. Could have said son of Ahaz. Joseph, 
you who come from a long line of people who have had to give up their expectations for what their life was going to look like. Joseph, son of all these people who have been willing to make sacrifices for the sake of what God is doing. You do not do this alone. You do it with the faithfulness of all of your ancestors before you. That, by the way, is the same kind of faithfulness that's within Jesus, Joseph's son. We're at a point now where I think it's fair to talk about uh, what does this mean for us? And I usually try uh, to look at the biblical story through a lens of what does this mean for me individually and what does this mean for us as a church? I think there's a bit of a framework here that we're given by the story, a framework of uh, discernment in uh, situations of tension, conflict. So let's talk about us as individuals first. What's a source of unrest in your life right now? Where do you have tension? Where is there conflict? You know that you can't continue on like this forever. Something needs to happen. The status of your country, there's some unrest. Mental health. Are there any fears or anxieties that seem to be underlying any of these tensions for you? Things that if you really allow yourself to do the deep discernment work, you realize that fear is motivating me to want to make a particular decision to solve this tension. For Joseph, it was, I don't want my family to disown me. Through prayer, through reading scripture, through seeking counsel of other people, through fasting, through doing all these things that we need to do in order to be able to come to a resolution, how are we going to solve this tension? The challenge for us is that even if we were to arrive at a particular decision, can we still be open to the voice of God speaking into our lives? Because even though we resolved to make a tough sacrifice, maybe we haven't picked the right object at that sacrifice. Remembering that as people of faith following Jesus, we are called to make sacrifices. Almost always, though, those sacrifices are more of ourselves and our own self-preservation and almost never the expense of relationship. And now let's talk about the church. Because I think this is a helpful framework for us corporately. Maybe let's just talk about us, Knox Presbyterian Church. I think... Uh, one of the most prevalent tensions that this church has held for much longer than I've been here has been, uh, well, finances are probably a symptom of this. That's probably not the core issue. Uh, but a lot of it has to do with this building, how much it costs, how it is not exactly reflective of the current life of the congregation anymore doesn't make a lot of sense intuitively. Getting around, some of our newest members know what that's like more than most people. So here's a tension that we have as a church. We can't afford this place. It doesn't make as much sense as it used to. We've lived like this for a long time. But at some point, something's got to give. Our bank account's going to run out. 
We've got to do something. A sacrifice has to be made. I know that our administration, facilities, and finance team uh, was working this last week on helping to craft a budget that then gets presented to session. The session will then vote to receive that budget. And that team has a really difficult job of looking at all of the dollars and the cents, all of the line items, trying to figure out how do we, if at all, make this balance. And in order to be able to make a budget balance where you're running a $25,000 a year deficit, you've got to make some sacrifices. I don't actually know what the result of their meeting this last week was, but I just know that that's just how it works. You've got to make some cuts if that's going to be the case. What's going to be challenging for us as a church and probably most challenging for your elected leaders will be, are we making the right sacrifices? We may have spent all this time looking at math problems. We may have spent time in prayer. We may have spent time doing all this, trying to discern, is this the sacrifice that we're supposed to make? Our challenge is going to be, can we continue to be open to hearing is there something else, Lord? Are you trying to awaken us in a dream? Are you trying to bring your spirit to us, your spirit of wisdom, of insight? That yes, we are called to be people of sacrifice. We just need to make sure that we're sacrificing the right things for God. Uh, in order to be able to do this well, I think we need to be a community that's praying together and that is discerning together. So uh, we're gonna continue with worship. Taylor's gonna lead a little bit more music. Um, and as she goes up there, and maybe even as she continue, or starts to play a little bit, I'm gonna uh, just have us pray for a little bit and invite this insight from the Holy Spirit about sacrifice. Would you pray with me? Oh Lord, Help us to be like Joseph. Help us to be upright people who are seeking to do the right thing. Help us to be your people who can be instruments of your peace. In order to do this, Lord, we need your help. We need your guidance. We need your wisdom. We need your clear, tangible intervention in order to guide the sacrifices that you are calling us to make. For us as individuals, in our individual tensions, our conflicts, for us as a country, and all the unrest that we have going on, Lord, we ask that you would help us to name what we are afraid of, and then help us to be brave and bold knowing that those fears are not powerful enough, they're not good enough reasons for us to choose to sacrifice something else. Lord, for us here at Knox Presbyterian, we ask for you to bring your deep peace, not the absence of anxiety, but the presence of your deep love. We ask that that would help us to guide the decisions that we need to make. Decisions about who we are as a church, about the stewardship of our resources, the stewardship of your land. How are you calling us to be instruments of your peace? How are you calling us to love? that clear to us, Lord. Speak to us now. Help us to be like Joseph, not talking, but listening. We're listening to you now.
you as you are able to stand as we sing our last song, Hope for Everyone. hope for us too. Friends, uh, I'm looking forward to being with you if you're around on Christmas Eve. It's at 6.30 here with our friends from Bethany. And then Christmas Day at 10 o'clock if you want to come and sing some carols and hear a story. It'll be good to be together.
Until then, friends, take this blessing with you. May God bless you and keep you. May God shine light upon you and be gracious to you. May you experience the presence of God within you now and always. May that give you God's deep peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.